right. Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you today. Man, there's a lot of you. This is fun. Uh, happy Sunday. As Mari just said, it's so fun to be here on Sunday morning with all of you. It has been good. You know, this is the first time that we've actually been live, both online uh, and here in person uh, in four months on a Sunday morning. So it's so good to be here gathered together. This is awesome. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time. That was an outstanding, outstanding time of worship. Um, you know, this is likely where we're going to be for a bit. Sunday mornings at 1030 here, drive-in service and online. Uh, and we recognize that things keep kind of shifting around us, right? We laid out plans for what we wanted to do in these next couple of weeks. And then we found out some clarification points that we uh, didn't know about. And so we're back here again. And, and uh, this week, uh, you know, in the midst of trying to figure out, you know, when do we get to you know, move back to Sunday morning services? When do we get to possibly move back inside? And, and some of the frustration that I felt like was setting in, I felt like God just kind of calmed me for a moment. And, and he brought some clarity uh, for me, he shifted my mindset this week. And now I'm realizing that I'm actually really excited that I still get to do this, that we still get to gather together in person, whether it is online or it is in our cars like this, because there are people around our world who don't have the privilege that we have to be able to still worship together uh, in person. And so I am so very grateful uh, and, and thankful that this is the life that we get to live. This is the way we still get to worship Jesus, even if it is from our cars, um, because we are together and that is a privilege to be able to do so. So I'm counting this week as a blessing and as a, I can plan to continue to count all these weeks as blessings as we continue to move forward. And I hope that you will do the same. Now, over the last uh, three weeks, we have been in a series called The King, uh, and it's a, a study through the Gospel of Mark, and it's been awesome so far. We've been able to dive into the text that Mark wrote, which was likely from the perspective of, of the disciple Simon Peter, uh, who, who uh, John Mark, who is the author of the Gospel of Mark, was uh, close in relationship to. Uh, they did ministry together, and so he wrote this, uh, this book, and it was most likely written to non-Jewish believers who were living uh, in Rome, and they were under great persecution. Now remember, if, if you're facing persecution, uh, the reality is, is it becomes easier and easier to start to doubt the things that you have been living with, the things that you, you uh, are following and you're believing. And so Mark, he noticed this with all these believers who were in Rome, and that's why he writes this gospel, so that they uh, will have a clear and concise story of the good news of Jesus Christ, so that they could be encouraged that, that what they are truly following, that they are truly following this, this king, and that it's worth pushing through whatever that they are facing. So that's why he wrote this gospel where we've been so far in this series uh, is that we've seen the start of Jesus's earthly ministry. Uh, he's called some of his disciples already to follow him. Uh, he has started teaching. He started casting out demons. Uh, he's healing people. And by this point, Jesus has really attracted a following of people who are seeking to find him everywhere that he goes. Um, so we also know, and we heard this last week, because last week we talked about the story of Jesus healing the paralyzed man, that Jesus has officially made the claim to his deity, which means that he has made the claim that he is God and that he carries the authority of God. Now, as a result of that, and on top of his, his following, all these people who are following him, and really his countercultural approach, uh, which we'll see again in the text today, the religious leaders were getting a little anxious because what they were recognizing is that whenever groups start gathering like this and following start happening of any, of any individual leader, there becomes a threat of a revolution. And so the religious leaders, they, they didn't want this to happen. They wanted to suppress any threat of a revolution happening with these followers of Jesus. So we'll see today more clashes with these religious leaders. Uh, we'll, we'll see some great lessons that we can learn from as well as we continue in on Mark's gospel. So Last week, we finished up the series or the sermon with um, the, the healing of the paralyzed man. And so we're going to go right on to the very next text. And this is what it says. It says, Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. Now, a few things that are important here is first, we already know that by this time, people gather when Jesus is around, right? We know that people are following him. 
But look at the story of Jesus asking Levi, who's also named Matthew, okay? A lot of people in the Bible have two names. I don't know why, but it's cultural. That's what, that's what happens. So Levi is also Matthew, who you might be familiar with because of the book of Matthew that we have in our Bibles. But it says here that as he walked along. So remember in chapter one, when we talked about Jesus calling Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and calling James and John, uh, these fishermen to follow him, it was before people were following Jesus everywhere. So in this moment of calling Levi, what is the setting? There's a large crowd, right? There's a large crowd that's gathered to hear him, te- and him, hear him teach. Some are intrigued by him. Some are investigating him, trying to figure out what this is all about, which we'll see that in a second. But it says, as he was walking, so with all these people, he sees the tax collector Levi at his booth and he says, follow me. Now, for those people following and listening to Jesus, this would be super surprising to them. These, these tax collectors, right? Levi, the tax collector, you know, they're regarded as, as collaborators with the Roman government. And they were despised by, by all the religious people in Israel because tax, the tax system was corrupt in Israel. People knew that the tax collectors skimmed money off the top to pocket for themselves. And so this crowd, which was most likely primarily made up of people of Jewish faith, they hated Levi, the tax collector. And Jesus is saying to this man, the scum of the earth in the eyes of the people to come and be my follower. Now, if that in itself is not enough for you to understand who Jesus is and how he wants you to follow him, no matter what your backstory is, then let's continue to read because Jesus decides after this that he's going to go eat at Levi's house. And this is what it says. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, you know, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I have, come to call the, I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. Well, there it is, right? Like, that's us. That's us, the sinners. And I love this. And I actually believe that, that this text, this, this, this comment that Jesus make, it makes, it portrays you know, more of the heart of Jesus than I think a lot of the rest of the gospels because it shows that Jesus is the redeemer. He's the redeemer. He redeems our stories. He redeems our sin. Like he's redeemed my struggle, right? Like we know, like you guys have heard my story, like my struggle with lust, God has redeemed that to be able to use that as a tool to help others who are going through the similar things that I have gone through in my life. And I know that many of you have been redeemed as well in your stories. And in this story, he redeemed Levi, the tax collector's story, to be one of his 12 disciples. This hated man is now one of his 12 disciples. And we also know that now he is the author of one of the four gospels that are teaching people about Jesus all around the world, even to this day. See, Jesus isn't just the king, but he's also our redeemer. But what we also see here in this story is once again, the Pharisees, the religious leaders are irked by Jesus. And you have to recognize that they have a way of doing things. These religious leaders, they have a way of doing things and they believe that all, the, all these religious wise teachers should also follow the way that they are doing things. And so Jesus, being assumed to be a wise teacher, kept going against their ideals and their convictions. And it continues because the, it goes on the next set of verses, talks about how the religious leaders were upset because Jesus' disciples weren't fasting like they were fasting. They weren't, and he even tries to make it you know, a family relation. He says, even John the Baptist's disciples would fast. Why don't your disciples fast? And I'm not going to read all these verses to you, but I'll give you pretty much the heart of it because Jesus turns it back on them and pretty much says, look, why do you fast? Don't you fast to draw close to God? Don't you fast so that you can, you can hear from God? So why would they fast? They're already with me. I just love that. I'm like, it's, it's, it's this I am statement again, that, that I am God. So why would they fast if they're already hanging out with me? Because they're hearing me and they're spending time with me. And, and, and then also because and he, he tells the religious leaders, like they don't have to fast now, but he says, but someday they will have to fast. So he's once again, making the statement, like I am God, but I'm also not going to be here forever. 
And there will be a day that they'll need to fast and they'll need to pray because I won't be with them. And then there's this break in the story and then we pick it back up with Jesus again in verse 23 of chapter two and it's the Sabbath, okay? And so the Sabbath is the ceremonial day of rest that every uh, Jew would participate in once a week. Uh, And and I wanna read you the law that we find in Exodus 20 that, that says what the Sabbath is before we break down the story. Because it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. This is the law. Six days you shall labor and do all your work but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So that was the law. That's the law for keeping the Sabbath. You work six days, you take a break, you don't do any work. No one in your family does any work. Your animals don't even do any work. That is the Sabbath. Uh, And in Jesus' time, people were still keeping the Sabbath and they're taking it very seriously. So I wanna go back to the story in Mark 2 because it says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some of the heads of the grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing such an unlawful thing on the Sabbath? How dare they pick grain on the Sabbath? That's unlawful to do on the Sabbath. And he answered, and he tells a story that you can read about in 1 Samuel 21. But he says, have you read the story? Have you read what David did when he and his companions were so hungry and they were in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, David entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread. And then he fed it, he gave it to those people who were with him. And that's, that's, which is lawful, only priests to eat. Sorry, I read that a little backwards around. But he ate the bread, which is lawful, only for priests to eat. And then he gave it to his companions, which was clearly him breaking the law of Moses. And then he said to them, the Sabbath, this is Jesus saying, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And I love that verse. Now, I'm a Sabbath keeper. I I love keeping my Sabbath. It's something that my family and I, we try to practice every single week, having a day of rest where you don't do any work. We spend time with as our family. Uh, We spend time with Jesus. We spend time in thanks. Uh, Truthfully, uh, that day has been a little bit more elusive during this COVID time, but we still try the best we can to take that day because it's so important. But it's true of this law, as it is with all the laws, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But the religious leaders, they had this backwards, which is why they kept getting so irritated with Jesus, because he kept doing things opposite of their religious preconceptions. See, they thought that they were made to follow the rules, and that if they did that all perfectly, then they would find more favor with God. But that's not what the gospel is. That's what religion is, but not the gospel. But maybe that's exactly what Jesus was trying to break. Mark Mark goes on to record a second incident that took place on the Sabbath. And that starts uh, in Mark 3. And it says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, hey, will you stand up here in front of everyone? He has them stand up in front of everyone. And then Jesus asked them, hey, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. So no one would respond to him. And says it looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, hey, stretch your hand out. And as he did, he stretched out his hand and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, why did Jesus get so angry with the people? Was it because they wouldn't respond to him like a teacher in a classroom, right? Like, come on, people, give me something. Or was it because he knew their hearts? Uh, he knew that these people were more concerned that the, that the Sabbath regulations would be observed than for a man to be healed. 
Their hearts were shriveled just like this guy's hand. Jesus knew what the Sabbath is about. He knew that the Sabbath is about restoring the weak. He knew that the Sabbath was about replenishing the drained. He knew that the Sabbath was about repairing the broken. So to heal the man's shriveled hand on the Sabbath was actually doing exactly what the Sabbath is about. But the Pharisees couldn't see this. They were so insecure and anxious and self-obsessed with the regulations that they couldn't even care about the man. And in this story, the problem is religion. See, in week one of this series, we talked about the difference between religion and the gospel or the good news. You might remember, you might not, but religion, uh, as in most religions around the world, is fundamentally just advice. How to live to gain favor with God where the gospel of Jesus is news. It's good news. It's about grace. It's about the gift that has been given to us. It's news that, gre- that brings great joy. So the reality of these stories is that you really see two different spiritual paradigms, right? You have two people. You have the Pharisees and you have Jesus. And both of them were trying to obey the law of God. Both wanted to keep the Sabbath day, but in one case, that obedience for the Pharisees was a burden. It was, it was shackles, while for the other, it's a delight. For Jesus, it's a delight. It's a gift to be able to rest, to have that day. See, most people in our world, they lean toward that first when it comes to their concept of if there is a God. Because if there is a God, then you, you relate to that God by doing good. And if I perform, if I obey, I will be accepted. But the gospel of Jesus is not only different from that, but it's completely opposed to it. See, as believers in Jesus, we don't obey him so that we will be accepted, but it's because we are fully accepted by Jesus that we obey. See, these laws that that the religious leaders in Jerusalem were so tied to the details of function differently in the life of Christians. For believers, it shows the life of love that we should want to live before our God who has done so much for us. It should show us how to serve God and others instead of being self-absorbed with ourselves. We should study and obey the law of God in order to discover the kind of life that we should live in order to please and resemble the one who has created us and who has redeemed us. The one who's delivered us from the consequences of our sin. We shouldn't be shackled to the, to the man-made details that hold us back more than the gospel freedom that allows us to be missional. Guys, following Jesus, it isn't religious. It's walking in freedom. So for the Sabbath, it was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Lord, the Son of Man was the Lord over the Sabbath. See, Jesus in this moment shows that the original principle of Sabbath is good. He affirms it. He celebrates it the need for rest. And yet he squashes the legalism around the observance by pointing to his own identity and his authority. He is Lord. He is God. And he is saying that humanity actually has the authority to do what they need to, even on the Sabbath. Now, as we have seen before, and as we will see now, this infuriated the religious leaders. They were not about this statement that Jesus was making. Because once again, Jesus is making an I am statement. And he makes these statements throughout the Gospels. In the, in the Gospel of John, it shows seven different times that Jesus uses the name I am. You know, examples like I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the good shepherd. It's in this name that he uses, I am. It's a name that was so sacred to Israel. We, we talked about it last week. It's so sacred to the Israelites that they wouldn't even utter this name. All right, we've talked about it before, the name Yahweh. And Jesus is claiming this name, I am the Lord Yahweh for himself. Jesus is the King. Jesus is God. Jesus is I am. Jesus is our creator. He is transcendent. Yet the religious leaders couldn't wrap their heads around this. I think I imagine that a lot of people today still can't really wrap their heads around this. I've heard a lot of people who say, yeah, I, I believe that Jesus was a good teacher, but I just can't believe that he was actually God. But the problem with that is that all that Jesus taught was directly tied to his identity. So if you like the teaching about the Sabbath that Jesus gave, well, that's because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the one who created the world and on the seventh day took a Sabbath. 
And if you struggle with this identity and you're, and you're hanging out in this middle ground of your beliefs, you have to make a decision because you really only have two options with this thing. Because Jesus is either a wicked liar and a crazy person and you should have nothing to do with him or he is who he says, is it, who he, says he is and your whole life should revolve around him. You should surrender yourself to him and let him lead you in every aspect of your life. See, too many Christians, we live in this middle ground that actually lacks integrity, right? You, you pray when you're in need or when you're in trouble, but the rest of the time you ignore him because you're busy or because you know that his commands actually don't align with the life that you want to live here on this earth. But guys, Jesus needs to become the access point of our spinning worlds. He has to be the center that our entire lives revolve around. And I'll add this because it's really we're in a time that it is more important than ever for us to put Jesus at the center, to let our lives revolve around him and not anything else that is happening. Because when we put Jesus at the center, we, we will experience the fullness of life that we actually have access to here on earth. We don't want to miss that. What's great about Jesus being at the center is, which is different than most popular belief, is that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfect because he already is. And his, his death on the cross for us allows us to be these imperfect, broken, mistake-ridden people who are covered by his grace and redeemed by his love. Meaning that even when we fall, we can get right back up and continue to follow him. Now, this Sabbath encounter that Jesus has with these religious leaders in Mark, it ends with a phrase that I believe actually sums up one of the main themes of our New Testament. And this is the last verse we read. It said, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, this is what is interesting about this verse. We already know some things about the Pharisees, right? We know uh, that they uphold, uphold traditional uh, Jewish virtues. We know uh, that they were overwhelmed with paganism and mixed up with and mixed up religious views. They felt like everyone needed to return to the traditional moral views that they had. They were staunch religious leaders. But who were the Herodians? Who were these people that they were collaborating with? Well, the Herodians were supporters of a king named Herod who was one of the most corrupt kings that ruled Israel. See, when Rome would conquer or, or occupy an area, they would set up rulers in those nations uh, who would represent them and their political systems. And so they had Herod over this area. And what came along with wherever Rome would go, whatever, whatever place they would conquer, they would bring along with them the Roman culture which was incredibly immoral. It was sex-driven. It was, it was a pagan religion, and it was anti-God of Israel. And in this moment, these two groups who were not used to cooperating, who are actually most commonly viewed as enemies, are now agreeing on this one thing, that they have to get rid of Jesus. And they were going to work together to make it happen. And the reason why I say this hints at one of, the, one of the main themes of the New Testament is because the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. It's offensive. It's offensive both to the religious and to the irreligious. See, the traditional views of religion is moral conformity, conform to the moral values, which is the approach that the Pharisees took. It is that you must lead a very, very good life, almost perfect life, and the approach of the irreligious on the other side which was the approach of the Herodians, is that of self-discovery. You have to figure out what is true for you. You have, to, you have to find out for you what is right. You have to find out for you what is wrong. And you do that by trying things, by trial and error. But according to the Bible, both of these approaches to life are actually placing ourselves in the place of Jesus. It's us trying to be our own Savior. It's us trying to be our own Lord. They both go against the message of Jesus and they both actually lead to self-righteousness because the religious moralists would say, the good people are in and the bad people are out. And of course, we're the good people. And then the self-discovery person says, oh, no, 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 no. The open-minded are in and the judgmental types are out. But that's not what the gospel says. The gospel says that the humble are in and the proud are out. The gospel says that those who know they're not better 
not more open-minded, who know they're, they're not more moral than anyone else, they are in. And the people who think that they're on the right side of the divide are the most in danger. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees when they, all, when they got all bent out of shape when Jesus was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors at Levi's house. He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. When Jesus says he's not coming for the righteous, he doesn't mean that some people don't need him. It's that some people don't recognize their need for him. Because who did the religious leaders think that they were? They thought they were healthy. They thought they were righteous. They thought that they had it all figured out. They thought that because they followed the law of Moses to a T, that they were set. But that's not the gospel. Look what Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, uh, starting in verse 20 of Romans 3. It says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Through the law, we recognize the sin that we have in our lives. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what being made known. It's been given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. There's no difference between the Pharisee and the Herodian, me or you, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate the righteous, his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. See, we all have sinned. We are all sinners. The Pharisees are sinners. The Herodians are sinners. Levi, the tax collector, was a sinner. The 12 disciples, sinners. Me, one of the worst. You, just as bad as I am. We are all sinners, and yet all are justified freely by the grace that Jesus gives us through that redemption that comes from Jesus Christ. We are redeemed. We are made holy. We are made clean. We are justified. Another way of saying justified is that we are made righteous. So literally by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and our belief in him, we are gifted with the position that all these religious people were trying so hard to attain. It's been gifted to us by believing in Jesus. We are redeemed. We are redeemed. We are made righteous because of what Jesus did for us, not by what we try to do for him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you God, I am, I'm reminded every single week, Lord, as we've been engaging in this text and going through these stories, God, how deep your love actually is for your people. Lord, that you love us so deeply that you want to, to give us your grace. That before your death, we were missing something. And then you died on the cross and you rose again, releasing your spirit to us, Lord, giving us this grace that covers all of our sins, Lord, that we can rest in that peace because of who you are. Lord, that if we put you at the center of our lives, we can live in the freedom that you give, Lord, and that we can have that peace. Lord Jesus, I recognize that there's people in our world who still think like the religious leaders do, who think that all the moral things that we need to do are gonna help us get closer to you. And I also know there's people in this world who are on the other side that the more I figure out for myself, the more joy that I will have. And Lord, we want to bring you to the center of it all. Jesus. We want to have you as our access point. Lord, we want our world revolving around you, not around the things of this world, not around these values and different things, but around you, Jesus. We want you at the center. So Lord Jesus, make that happen, Lord. And I think for all of us, and I really want to ask these two questions for us who are watching online and for you here in person, because if you've never actually said yes to Jesus, 
you've never believed in him, then you aren't experiencing the fullness of life that he has for you. You haven't experienced that grace and that love that he has poured out for you. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, then you are saved. I'm saved. I follow the king. Have you made that decision for your life yet? And if you haven't done that, all it is is simply a prayer to him saying, Jesus, I believe. I want you in my life. I want to surrender myself over to you. And if you do that, you're in. That, that sets it apart. Our next request would get yourself baptized, which we can talk about another time. It's a little bit different during these COVID times to baptize, but we can make it happen. And the second question I want to ask is if you're in a place where you're a believer, but you recognize that Jesus is not at the center, it's time to reset your world to put him in the middle, to set him as the one you're going to follow. And so if that's you today, make the decision to say, I'm going to put Jesus back at the center of my life. I want to follow him. So Lord Jesus, we praise you, God, and I pray for anyone here who needs to make one of those decisions, God, that, that they will see the fruit of it when they do, or that you will come rushing in and show them your love and your grace and your peace, Lord, that they'll find joy, joy of the great news of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. We give you this time, Lord. We give you this week. Be with us, Lord. We continue to pray over our community, uh, pray over our world, Lord, in this worldwide pandemic, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you will bring healing to this land, to all the people, Lord Jesus. And I also pray, Lord, that you will use this time to continue to awaken your church, to awaken people to to the truth that is Jesus Christ, uh, because I know that you can use times like this to do that. Lord, we also just pray for everything else, the brokenness and the hurt and the pain that is currently happening in our world, Lord Jesus, that you will bring healing, that you bring unity, Lord, and that it will happen with you at the center of it. We love you, Jesus. We serve you with our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen.